What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh, and today we're going to be diving into the very dark history of a killer family from the 1800s nicknamed the Bloody Benders. Before we get into the episode, though, this will be my last episode for a few weeks as my daughter is coming very, very soon. So I'll be taking a couple weeks off for paternity leave. I appreciate everybody's support and love as I take some time to enjoy this very profound moment in my life and obviously in my daughter's life. So this will be the last episode for a little while, but I will be back very soon. So hang in there with me. And if you haven't already, check out the new merch collection. I'm wearing the Haunted House shirt today. Really, really cool designs. We still have some items left, so if you want to check out the merch, it's milehiremerch.com. You'll see the Lights Out page. And yeah, I don't think I'll be restocking any of the designs, so if you want it, get it while you can. But this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Upside, Green Chef, and Babel. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the story of the Bloody Benders. In the 1870s, The Osage Township in Kansas was a small rustic settlement along an old Native American trail. This trail was known as the Great Osage Trail, named after the indigenous people who lived in the surrounding lands. By the 1820s, this route had become the first leg of the Santa Fe Trail that took many travelers across the United States, and many of those travelers who passed through Kansas took the option of staying at a small one-room inn along that trail. It was a rugged building out in the middle of quiet countryside. Only five families lived out there, along with the undeveloped prairies. And this was the only inn for miles, run by four people known as the Bender family. The family was made up of John Bender Sr., his wife Almira, his son John Jr., and his daughter Kate. They were believed to be German immigrants and John was pushing 60 by the time they made it to Kansas. His wife was 55, but John didn't worry much about his age. He was a strong, giant man who stood well over six feet. He was rarely seen without his combed back long hair and collared shirts. He often smelled like he hadn't showered in weeks, and his clothes were as dirty as his cabin. He had piercing black eyes underneath bushy eyebrows, and so he got the nickname old beetle brow john when he arrived to kansas he had long hair and a bushy beard after his travels so he decided to keep the style he figured that it matched the rugged style of rural kansas and it did a great job at concealing his face from strangers the other families in the area described him as a wild and woolly man and he took it as a compliment when the family first settled in kansas After the Civil War, they picked one of the available claims on the land, and they began building their home. It was a 160-acre section of land on the western slopes of Rolling Hills. These mounds are still known as the Bender Mounds today. When John Bender Sr. noticed that the piece of land was located directly between the City of Independence and Fort Scott, He knew that this would be a great place to build an inn. So they built a small one-room framed cabin, a barn and a corral, and a well for fresh water. Inside the one-room cabin, they sectioned off rooms with large pieces of canvas. They kept their own bedrooms in the back and put a small inn and grocery store towards the front. They built a crude sign where they etched the word groceries into a piece of wood and hung it above the front door. They hoped this small sign would draw travelers along the Osage Trail into their cabin. Their little grocery store sold gunpowder, bullets, groceries, liquor, and tobacco. They even sold fully cooked meals and provided a safe place to stay overnight. To the travelers, the Benders looked like any other family struggling to make a living in the post-Civil War Midwest. They made their claim on the land and worked hard to maintain it. But as visitors came by, the first thing they noticed was that they had a hard time understanding the benders. 
John and Elmira both had incredibly thick German accents, so they had to speak in short, simple sentences. Elmira also didn't have the patience of an innkeeper. She was a heavy-set woman who didn't take shit from anyone. She'd often be rude to customers because there was no other grocery store in for miles. So to the travelers who had to put up with her poor attitude and her harsh, guttural accent. Some of the travelers also noticed that she used the kitchen cauldron to boil large batches of roots and herbs. And when they asked her what she would plan on using them for, she told them she was a medium who could speak to the dead. She used her concoctions to cast charms and spells. The nearby neighbors began calling her a she-devil once they heard the rumors of her witchcraft. And they also noticed that John Sr. and John Jr. did everything she told them to do. Her wish was their command. And she ran the inn with no questions asked. John Jr. wasn't like his father at all. He was much skinnier and less willing to do hard labor. He was only about 25 years old when they first came to Kansas. And he also claimed property just north of his father but never did anything with the land. He had a thin face, small eyes, and a bit of red in his brown hair. And he kept a nicely trimmed mustache above his upper lip. Luckily, he spoke better English than his parents did, and his accent wasn't as thick. He was usually social with the guests, but the more he talked with them, the stranger he seemed. Sometimes the guests would notice John Jr. trailing off during conversations and end up laughing at strange things or just nothing at all. This made many of the guests believe he might have been intellectually disabled, and many avoided talking with him. As for Kate, she was the friendliest and most liked of the whole Bender family. She spoke English well, with only a slight German accent, and she had the best social skills when talking with customers. She was 23 years old and overly friendly with the strangers at the inn. Many thought she was pretty, and she had beautiful auburn hair that she kept above her shoulders. Her and her brother also went to Sunday school at the Harmony Grove schoolhouse nearby, and she gained popularity pretty quickly with the others. Like her mother, she was also a psychic and a healer. She was known to perform seances and give lectures on occult spiritualism. She even claimed that she had the power to speak to the dead and cure certain illnesses with psychic powers. After gaining popularity in the community, she realized she could make money doing this. So she started giving lectures once a week about spiritualism and psychic abilities. In her lectures, she started talking about free love and having sex with anyone you desire. Even if that meant it was your sibling. Since she was so open about incest, People believed she had a sexual relationship with John Jr. She also openly talked about the justification of murder. She believed that murder was brave, noble, and natural. And as her popularity grew, the locals who disliked her began calling her satanic. Kate and her mother had gotten a similar reputation around town when it came to their passion for the occult. But at least Kate was well liked by travelers and her personality was perfect for entertaining the guests in the family inn. But that's not all her charm and good looks were used for. Not long after their business was in full operation, many travelers stopped by for groceries and a place to stay. Many of them also carried large wads of cash in their bags. Sometimes they carried their whole life savings on them because they had the same idea as the benders. They were out looking for a place to make their claim and build a new home and start a new life. But after the benders opened their inn, some of the travelers began disappearing without a trace. And when their friends and families would search for them, they could only follow their breadcrumb trail as far as Big Hill Country in southeast Kansas. After that, they were never seen again. But back in the day, it wasn't totally uncommon for people to disappear without a trace. Sometimes men just kept traveling west looking for a new place to settle. And plus, they didn't have any means to connect with their family or contact them for a while. 
So the search parties would return home and anxiously wait for a letter. But sometimes those letters would never come. The first few that went missing didn't raise the alarm in Osage Township. Traveling cross country was dangerous in those days and people knew the risks. As they came across the Bender Inn, it looked like a decent place to stay. And Kate made all the guests feel welcome and warm. She would convince them to stay for a fresh homemade meal and she would sit them down at the table. She always made sure they sat on the side with their backs towards the canvas that separated their bedrooms from the inn. She would then charm the men by flirting with them. Sometimes she even showed them her psychic abilities to make sure she had their attention. The men would become entranced with her performance as they ate their meals, and they had no idea that John Sr. and John Jr. waited behind the canvas curtain, holding hammers. Once they were in position, they flung back the curtains and cracked the men over the head with their metal hammers. After the guests fell unconscious, Kate and her mother would dig through the victim's pockets taking everything they could find. Once they had taken every last coin, they dragged the body to a trap door in the floor that led to a brick cellar beneath the cabin. Kate would then grab a knife, jump down into the cellar with the victim, and slit their throat. They would then wait until night to bury the body out in the garden behind the house. They did this like clockwork, and they got away with it, over and over again. In May of 1871, the body of a man only known as Jones was the first victim to be discovered in Drum Creek. His skull had been cracked and his throat slashed. The owner of the nearby property was suspected, but local authorities took no action. Early the next year, two more bodies were found with the same injuries, but again nothing was done. So the benders continued, murdering their guests for months. After over a dozen successful murders, the inn welcomed two new guests, a father and a daughter named George and Marianne Longker. In the winter of 1872, the two of them had left their home in Independence, Kansas, and decided to move to Iowa. But like many who had taken the same trail, they were never heard from again. Like the others, the father and daughter were eventually buried in the garden behind the Bender Inn. In the spring of the following year, a family friend named Dr. William York went looking for the father and daughter. Him and George were Civil War veterans, and they lived down the street from each other. Before George and his daughter left, they told Williams where they were headed. And once Williams hadn't heard from them for months, he figured something was wrong, and he went looking for them. He stopped around several homes around Osage to ask the locals if they had seen the Longkers. He had traveled all the way to Fort Scott where one of his brothers lived, and he decided to search the homes from there all the way back to his home in Independence. But like the others who traveled along the trail, he never made it home. Somewhere between the fort to the city, he disappeared. Luckily, he told both of his brothers where he was going. So when he didn't come home, they narrowed down where he could have disappeared. His brother convinced a local colonel from the fort to put together a troop of 50 men to look for his brother. And they ended up marching through every home along the trail, including the Bender Inn. The Bender family welcomed the colonel and some of his men inside. And they even admitted that Dr. York had come by their cabin. But they convinced the search party that he had left. And they made up a story of how the local indigenous people probably ambushed him in the wilderness. When questioned, Almira pretended like she couldn't speak English. And by the end of the visit, the colonel and his men thought the family was strange and off-putting. But they saw nothing out of place at the property. They moved on. But then they returned to the property a few days later after they heard reports of Almira threatening a woman with knives. When the colonel accused her, she flew into a fit of rage. She screamed about how the woman had cursed her batch of coffee, so she threatened her. And after telling her side of the story, she ordered the men to leave her home. The colonel and his men realized that Almira had been pretending that she couldn't speak English the first time they had visited. The daughter Kate also put on a show of her own. 
She tried to help the search party by attempting to use her psychic abilities to locate Dr. York. She touched a finger to her head and rolled back her eyes. She pretended to search for him and ended up accusing a neighboring family, the Roaches. She claimed that they had killed Dr. York and that they all should hang for their crimes. But the colonel said that they needed hard evidence before any action could be taken. Again, his visit to the Bender Inn was strange and there were clearly some secrets in the family but he couldn't find anything incriminating. So the colonel and his men returned to the fort. We'll dive back into the investigation into the Bender family right after this quick word from our sponsors. From cringing at the pump to getting an eye-popping check at your favorite restaurant, inflation is hitting us all where it hurts. And it really hurts. That's why I started using Upside Upside is an incredible app for anyone who buys gas, groceries, or dines out. With every purchase, I'm earning cash back, thanks to Upside. With gas being over $5 a gallon, it's nice to save money wherever you can. And with Upside, what's great is that you can find a local gas station, and they have a bunch they work with, BP, Shell, Valero, Exxon. You activate the offer for the cash back on the gas, and then you go to that gas station, you pump your gas. And all you got to do is scan your receipt or upload your receipt and boom, instant cash back. So to get started, download the free Upside app in the App Store or Google Play. Use my promo code lights out and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Again, just claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside. Check in at the business, pay as usual with credit or debit card and get paid. It works with all kinds of brands, grocery stores, restaurants. There's Popeye's on there that I've used before, which is awesome. So you can eat, get gas, all the things you need to do and get cash back with Upside. In comparison to credit card rewards or loyalty programs, you can earn three times more cash back with Upside. And you can cash out anytime to your bank account, PayPal, or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Upside users are earning more than a million dollars every week. That's probably why they have a 4.8 star rating on the App Store. Download the free Upside app and use promo code LIGHTSOUT to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. For all of your summer travels, whether you're going abroad or staying domestic, and you want to immerse yourself in the culture, now is the perfect time to start Babbel. Babbel is a language learning app that's sold more than 10 million subscriptions. Thanks to Babbel's addictively fun and easy bite-sized language lessons, there's still time to learn a new language before you reach your destination. I used Babbel a whole bunch before I went to Mexico last year. I got to say it was super helpful to be able to learn a lot of just easy phrases to say in Spanish. I mean, I did take Spanish in high school, but we all know how that went. Uh, Not a lot of learning, a lot of goofing around. And just the way that they taught me Spanish was just way harder than it needed to be. I mean, so much of it was about conjugating verbs and writing Spanish when all we really want to do is speak the language. With Babbel, you only need 10 minutes to complete a lesson, so you can start having real-life conversations in a new language in as little as three weeks. Plus, other language learning apps use AI for their lessons plans. Babbel lessons are created by over 150 language experts, and their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. With Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you to improve your pronunciation and accent. There are so many ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes. Plus, it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee, so you got nothing to lose. So start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, save up to 60% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash lights out. And our last sponsor for today is Green Chef, which we've worked with HelloFresh in the past, and you know that Green Fresh and HelloFresh are now the same company. HelloFresh actually owns Green Chef. They just have a wide array of meal plans to choose from, and there's something for everyone. I love switching between Green Chef, HelloFresh, every plate, because they all have something different to offer at all different price points, which is amazing. Green Chef now offers variety and flexibility more than ever before with double the choices. Now you can choose from all 24 recipes weekly with the option to mix and match meals from different preferences. You can enjoy vegan one day, keto the next, In most families, members of the household eat differently. Now you can order meals to suit every lifestyle. They've got vegan, vegetarian, keto, and paleo, Mediterranean, fast and fit, and gluten-free all in one box. 
I love Green Chef because they really help you save time by cutting down on weekly meal planning, prepping, and grocery shopping. Everything's pre-measured and prepped, so it's easy to get home-cooked meals on the table in no time. Plus, they use seasonal produce, premium proteins, and organic ingredients you can trust. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. Green Chef is the most sustainable meal kit and the only meal kit that is both carbon and plastic offset which means they offset 100% of their carbon footprint as well as 100% of the plastic in every box. With Green Chef, you're actually reducing your food waste by at least 25% versus grocery shopping. Some of my favorite Green Chef recipes include steak and butternut squash salad, green pea falafel with tahini, and salmon with fatouche salad. Green Chef is absolutely delicious. It's definitely the healthiest of the meal kits, and it's great for those that have specific diets that you're wanting to stick to. They make it really, really easy to do so. So go to greenchef.com slash lights out 135 and use code lights out 135 to get $135 off across five boxes and your first box ships free. All right, let's jump back into the bloody benders. So with all these travelers going missing, rumors soon spread through the area. The trail became known for horse thieves and villains. Even stories of wolves, witches, and human sacrifices were told around campfires, and travelers began avoiding that section of the Osage Trail. After the colonel and his men came back from their search, neighboring communities began pointing fingers and claiming that something evil was terrorizing Osage County. Once the story went public, the members of the township called the community together and had a meeting at the Harmony Grove Schoolhouse to try and solve the problem. 75 townspeople gathered in March of 1873. This included John Sr. and John Jr. who sat in the dark corner of the schoolhouse. As the people began discussing the problem, the townsfolk mentioned that a total of 10 people had gone missing in the area. One was a well-known doctor named William H. York, and his brother was at the meeting. He demanded a massive search of the area. So the townspeople recommended that every farmstead should be searched from tip to toe. Almost everyone in the schoolhouse agreed to have their property searched, except for the benders. They sat in the corner, quietly looking at each other before sneaking out the back. About a week later, a neighbor named Billy Toll came by the house. He noticed that the front door of the Bender Inn had been left open. The grocery sign above the door was gone, and their farm animals on the property looked half-starved. Their shadowy rib cages showed through their fur, and it looked like they hadn't eaten in days. Billy had always been a little suspicious of the family, so he contacted the township trustee, Leroy Dick, and they quickly formed a search party. This search party included Colonel A.M. York and his men from the nearby Fort Scott and Dr. York's brother who had come looking for him. When they arrived at the property, they knocked on the door but heard no responses. The colonel carried a loaded gun as he stepped inside the cabin. When he looked around, all the food, clothing, and personal items were gone. All that remained was dusty furniture and a few canvas sheets hanging from the ceiling, and about a dozen bullet holes were scattered through the roof. Also, a wretched smell filled the whole cabin. After looking around, one of the men spotted a trap door on the floor that had been nailed shut. This is where flies had gathered and the awful smell was the strongest in the house. So the men pried each board of the trap door loose until it was big enough to look inside and a horrid smell came up from the floorboards the room below was dark it was a small cellar lined with brick walls but as they lit a lantern and lowered it into the secret room below they saw a large six foot hole filled with red clotted blood it looked like rancid jello that couldn't be absorbed by the ground but there were no bodies in the hole, just blood. This was enough to convince the men that something horrific had been going on at this house. So they got enough men to lift the entire cabin and move it several yards to the side. They dug up the land that surrounded the bloody hole, but still no bodies. So they started digging up the ground where the benders had planted an orchard and a vegetable garden out back. Some of the men spotted an area in the soil that looked freshly disturbed. When they placed their shovels into the dirt, they quickly found the first body. The tips of their shovels dug into a naked human foot, and the body had been buried head first into the shallow hole. 
The feet were only a few inches from the surface, and they dug for several minutes, slowly excavating the body. When they finally pulled it out, the brother of Dr. York immediately identified the body of his missing brother. His skull had been smashed with a blunt object, and his throat had been slit from ear to ear. After discovering the first body, the group of men spent the entire next day digging up the property. Nine more bodies and several dismembered body parts were found. One body was even found at the bottom of the freshwater well. Most of the victims were men, but one was a woman, and another was a young, longer girl. She was only seven or eight years old. What's worse is that she had multiple non-lethal wounds on her body, and evidence showed that she might have been buried alive. At the end of the long day, the yard had been completely torn up, and the victims lay scattered on the ground covered in white sheets. Wooden caskets were constructed so that they could load the bodies up and haul them away. The men who uncovered the victims ended up naming the property Hell's Half Acre. Nearly 20 victims were uncovered on the property, but less than half could be identified. And this grisly property became the site of one of the earliest mass murder burial grounds in America. So not long after the discovery of the bodies, word had gotten home to the York family about William's death. Another brother of his was a lawyer and a state senator over in Independence. Grieving over his brother's death, he offered a $1,000 reward, which was about $25,000 in today's money, as he wanted information that could lead to the Bender family's arrest. In May, Governor Osborne tripled the reward if all the family members were brought to justice, and it didn't take long before the story spread like wildfire. Journalists from New York and Chicago caught on to the story, the biggest questions were, who really was the Bender family? And where had they come from? The only thing people knew about them was that they were from Germany, but even that might have been a lie. Investigators from the big cities traveled all the way to Kansas to take a look at the cabin. They scoured through the property and tore it apart so they could collect clues and souvenirs. Even the bricks covered in thick blood from the cellar were removed. Eventually, as the journalists swept through southeast Kansas, they pieced together as much as they could of the Benders' mysterious backstory. As it turned out, the Benders weren't even a real family. It's believed that only Kate and her mother were related by blood. John Bender Sr. was actually named William Bender, or possibly John Flickinger. John Bender Jr. was actually named John Gebert. He was known to laugh aimlessly, but later people suspected that might have been to trick people into believing he had an intellectual disability. Almira Bender was actually born Almira Mike. Supposedly she was from upstate New York and had several husbands and 12 children, and it's believed that she killed all of her husbands and three of her oldest children before moving to Kansas. Kate was her fifth child, and her real name might have been Eliza Griffith, or Eliza Sarah Davis. She disguised her name as Kate when she moved to Kansas. Along with working at the inn, it was also believed that she worked as a prostitute. She would sleep with the travelers to make extra money, but it was also believed that she was the mastermind behind the outlaw crew. John Jr. might have actually been her husband and not her brother. And there were rumors that John had impregnated Kate several times, and each time she gave birth, they would murder the baby by bashing their head in. It's also estimated that the Bender stole about $4,600 from their victims, which is over hundred grand in today's money. They also stole two teams of horses and wagons, and since many of their victims had almost nothing of value, many believe that the Benders killed mostly for the thrill of it, and money was only a bonus. As the investigation continued, more and more travelers came forward to tell their stories about the Bender Inn. Many of the survivors' stories were the same. One man in particular, William Pickering, said that Kate had led him to the dinner table to eat, and she insisted that he sit with his back to the canvas, but he noticed dark stains splattered across the canvas that looked like blood, so he refused to sit there. When he went to sit on the other side of the table, 
Kate drew a long knife and threatened to kill him. And that's when he bolted for the front door and never looked back. Another traveler, a Catholic priest, also fled the property when he noticed one of the Bender men was concealing a hammer. He wondered why they were all acting so strange, so his gut instinct told him to leave the property. After all the stories came forward, it was clear that the Bender family had been terrorizing the region for the past few years. From the cabin, a search party followed a fresh trail of wagon tracks that led away from the Bender's property. The tracks went all the way to a small town 12 miles north of their property. From there, they bought four train tickets heading northbound to Humboldt, and they left their wagons and horses not far from the train station, and the horses were found nearly starved a day later. When the search party questioned the train conductor, he said that John Jr. and Kate got off the train at Chanute and took a different railway south towards Red River County where the tracks ended. The two then supposedly fled to an outlaw colony along the Texas and New Mexico border. Local lawmen didn't pursue the couple. It was well known that lawmen who went into the outlaw region never returned. One detective later claimed that he traced the pair to the colony and learned that John Jr. had eventually died from a stroke, but his death was never confirmed. Meanwhile, John Sr. and Elmira stayed on the northbound train to Kansas City. Then they hopped on a train to St. Louis, and locals were desperate to find the benders. So many locals formed vigilante groups across Kansas and began hunting down the family. Some claimed that they had found the benders and shot them all to death except Kate, as they decided to burn her alive since they thought she was a witch. Others claimed they caught the family and lynched them all. Once they were dead, they threw their bodies into the Verdigris River. Another group claimed that they had killed the benders in a shootout and buried the bodies in a nearby prairie. But after all these stories, no one ever claimed the massive bounty that had been put on the benders' heads, and none of their bodies were ever found. So many believe that the crew was still at large. Over the next 50 years, people still search for the family. In 1889, two women named Elmira Monroe and Sarah Davis were arrested in Niles, Michigan for larceny. They were later released from jail after being found not guilty, but only two weeks later they were arrested again for the Bender murders. A daughter of one of the victims had tracked the two women down in Michigan and believed they were the two Bender women who had killed her father. She then reported them to the police. Two Osage Township witnesses said they recognized the women from an old photograph and confirmed it was the Bender women. As the police took them into custody, Almira Monroe screamed that she wouldn't be taken alive, but the officers were able to wrestle her to the ground and handcuff her. When the investigators questioned the two women, Sarah quickly folded. She told police that Almira Monroe was actually Almira Bender, but she swore she wasn't Kate. Instead, she said she was actually Kate's sister, and during the other interrogation, Almira Monroe denied that she was the Bender mother. And once she realized that Sarah had betrayed her, she told police that Sarah was definitely Kate Bender. So the two women had turned on each other, and they were escorted back to Kansas. They were actually put on trial, but it was later discovered that Almira Monroe had gotten married in Michigan when the murders at the cabin were taking place. At the end of the trial, it was obvious the two women were criminals and liars, but nothing connected them to the Bender murders besides eyewitness testimony, so the charges were dropped. Many pairs of women that traveled through Kansas during the time were accused of being Kate and her mother. These accusations were serious at first, but as decades passed, the accusations became a local joke. As the story of the Bender women became American folklore, in 1884, it was reported that John Sr. took his own life in Lake Michigan. The same year, a man that matched his description was arrested in Montana for a murder committed in Idaho. The victim had their skull crushed with a hammer, so investigators connected the two cases almost immediately. A message was sent to the station requesting positive identification of John Sr., but while in custody, the suspect cut off his own foot to escape his shackles. As he limped away, blood poured from his wounds, and he soon bled to death. By the time a deputy discovered his body, the suspect had already begun to decompose, so it was impossible to identify him. 
Even though the man wasn't identified as John Sr., his skull was later put on display in a local saloon. The display had the words, Pa Bender, beneath the skull. It was later taken down when the saloon was forced to close during Prohibition in 1920. Some believe that Almira and Kate ended up murdering John Sr. because he tried to escape with all the money. But after all the tales traveled around the country, no one knows where the Benders fled, and the story faded into folklore. Whatever truly happened to the Benders still remains one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of the Old West. The story has gone down in the books of American legends, but their story never ended. A decade after the murders were uncovered, nothing was left on the Bender property. The cabin had been dismantled, the garden and orchard died off, and the only thing left behind was a single hole where the cellar had been. From this pocket within the earth, many believe the spirits of those who died here emerged from this hole. This is where the Benders slit the throats of their victims and drained their blood, and now they emerge as spirits from the pit. Some visitors have claimed that they have seen them wandering the property grounds. People still return to the area in hopes of finding a souvenir. But what they end up finding is a glowing apparition moaning and crying. Some even say that the soul of Kate Bender is trapped on the property and she's doomed to stay there forever. The tale of the bloody Benders was so popular across America that in 1961 a museum was created in Cherryvale. They actually built an exact replica of the cabin and placed 1800s antiques and furniture inside so that visitors could get a feel for what the cabin actually felt like. In 1967, three of the Bender hammers were donated by a local family, but the museum was eventually shut down in 1978 after stirring up enough controversy. Many locals were conflicted about having their own town famously known for an atrocity, so the cabin was torn down and a fire station was built in its place. All the artifacts, newspaper clippings, hammers, and photographs were moved to the Cherryvale Museum and can still be seen today. Along with the museum, a state historical marker sits just one mile north of the old Bender property. This might be the only historical marker in the U.S. that celebrates the site of a mass murder. But the story of the Bloody Benders has definitely claimed its place in American folklore and it's been about 150 years since the murders. And as time has passed, the Bender murders have become a relic of a time when outlaws and open land claim the West. Nearly 20 people disappeared and the murderers vanished across the country with no DNA evidence, no real names, and only a few ticket stubs left behind. The Benders showed just how easy it was to get away with murder. In the end, they came out with $1,000 apiece and a dead or alive bounty on their heads. And many believe that their souls might spend eternity trapped in the barren Bender Mounds of Southeast Kansas. Some of the victims' names of the Bender family were Mr. Jones, Henry McKenzie, Ben Brown, W.F. McCrady, John Geary, Johnny Boyle, George Lonker, Marianne Lonker, Red Smith, Abigail Roberts, Dr. William York, and obviously many more unidentified victims. But this story of the Bloody Bender family is a wild one that would only exist in the Wild West. It's just crazy to think about what a different time period it was to be able to just go out to the middle of nowhere and just claim land for yourself start living there but you never know who your neighbors were and it's almost like the original sort of story of hh H. holmes before hh H. holmes these guys were serial killers before serial killers became a thing trapping victims murdering them seems like just for the pleasure of it seems like these guys were just deranged i kept thinking i'm like god surprised the story isn't like a movie yet maybe it is but this would be a crazy movie but that's where i'm going to wrap up today's episode let me know what your thoughts are on the bloody bender family 
Do you like hearing these stories and cases from the 1800s? I know I like to kind of go back sometimes and just try to figure out and picture what life was like back then. It was it was brutal, man. It was a totally different experience. But I find a lot of these stories from the Old West to be super interesting and stories of outlaws and just how crime was back then. It was totally different. But yeah, let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you again for joining me for another episode of Lights Out. I'll see you in a couple weeks. But until then, Lights Out, everybody. Everybody.